thanks for joining me on episode two. Uh, we've classified it as avoid torpedoes. So in episode one, we already went through the guidelines and the coaching call of how to use the action score, how to go through and read it and interpret it, as well as create your own shortlist. Before the call, you've done a lot of homework already, so let's just dive into it, okay? All right. Just a disclaimer, I'm going to, here, here it is, three, two, one. So in episode two, the topics I want to discuss is uh, you put in about three hours already uh, creating that shortlist, so we'll go through that. Um, we'll also discuss the difficulties you encountered, especially with $1,000. I'm sure you came through a lot of setbacks here and there compared to like if somebody was trying to invest 10, 20, or 30K. Okay. Uh, we'll reveal your initial um, shortlist. Well, maybe we'll, we can go straight to your final sh um, stock list because you've already provided that. Okay. And then I'll go through like uh, some ideas on how to check uh, and keep up with the stocks that you have. Let's say if something like went from an A to a C and or or even an F, then you want to reevaluate and see whether it's actually worth holding or not, uh, or whether it should be replaced with something else. All right, and then great. I'll end with an example of a torpedo, a bomb of a stock that, and a typical method of investing or so-called investing that um, just came up today. So it's a recent example I just found while I was reading uh, the investing Reddit. So it was a pretty good example. So I'll end with that. But let's go through this again. So with your $1,000, uh, what do you mean by your initial criteria was stifled? Like what initial criteria were you talking about? I wanted to follow the framework that you provided from the earlier episode as well as um, things that George's Wu paper provided. He made a portfolio of of A stocks. So I want to start off with that as my benchmark, but some stocks are just worth like $200, for example, and that's that's too much for me to put 20 stocks that are worth 200 when you only have 1,000. That's only like five, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so obviously I can't do that. And, and then um, not only that, there are a couple stocks too that I just wanted with more margin of safety. For me to make to pull the trigger now, I, I needed to wait and I couldn't wait because I wanted to do it do every have the 20 to 30 stocks now. So with that I had to widen my restrictions. So I ended up having to go to um, point bullet point four there with uh, A to B stocks. I didn't want to choose OTC stocks either because the fact that it's not, it's not that liquid. And not to mention, um, I'm pretty sure pump and dump schemes are still prevalent, so it makes me want to short, short sell OTC stocks instead. But that's not a feature in Robinhood. I'm um, staying away from that. For selling my four initial stocks, I saw that the price action wasn't too good. There were probably much better shorts, and I, I just didn't want to handle that. And I think it'd be better just to start off with a fresh foot of uh, 20, somewhere in the range between new 20 to 30 stocks, like if anyone else wants to try along too. The funny part was following the quantitative method listed in OSV is I thought this would only take me an hour. <laughs> but then when I realized all these restrictions <laughs> that came in, it took me like three hours. <laughs> so I guess be prepared for that if anyone wants to start off their own thing. After narrowing it down from A to B and then decent looking stocks from like pri uh, price range, like as in like all the shares cost like $60 or less. Um, I narrowed it down to 45 decent looking stocks and it was and I had to like pay attention to it twice because like three hours later three of the B grades turned into a C grade so yeah I had to cut those two <laughs> uh, so it's like it's I don't want to even have the chance of that downside risk also when filtering for these stocks I made sure the Piotrowski score was was seven or greater too I didn't want to mess with any um, ones that are messing with their own financial statements um, try to keep it as close to a good quality as I could for price restrictions ended up with 23 candidates today when i was um working on them i noticed that the 23rd one turned into a c so i also good at that one too <laughs> so now there's 22 apparently six of them were property and causality insurance i thought about taking out a couple of them but for the sake of getting 20 i just kept them in <laughs> i think that's pretty much it i, I don't i don't know if you want me to talk about my exit strategy but we can say that for later if you want yeah 
I've gone through your shortlist. It actually looked pretty good. Now, like you said, there are six in a single industry. So I'm not quite sure about that. But again, with your capital size, I don't think there's much of an alternative. Right. Uh, you know how the other day I was talking about how in the top 10 at the beginning of the year, there was like uh, most of them were retail. Uh-huh. And so this could be also the case where at the moment, this particular um, industry, like in the financials and property and uh, casualty insurance has been like hammered down for some reason. Uh, and it's just a matter of, so when something like this comes up, this is where I usually do the extra double checks to make sure or to try and pick what I would think is the two or three best fundamentally as well. I guess... Going off of this too, on um, making sure there aren't too many stocks in one sector, I mean, in industry, sorry. Maybe someone with starting with $1,000 with a restricted account size, maybe you might want to just pick your 10 best stocks. I mean, if I wasn't, if I didn't already commit to do 20, I probably would have just done 10. And I'm also thinking not work out that well simply because with 10 I mean with 10 stocks with a thousand dollars the whole point of a quant strategy is to limit your risk because I'll show you the uh, the example in the torpedo section where this one person put a hundred thousand dollars of his own money into one single stock <laughs> and then I'll show you what the I'll show you what the result was in one and a half days that's why even with um, $1,000, it's all about the process, getting into the right mindset. Yeah, it's a smaller capital size and yes, there are some restrictions. But at the same time, if we can just treat this $1,000 like it was $100,000 or something and try to treat it like that, I think that's going to put you into like a really good frame of mind and process orient for the long term. Hey, the beautiful part is this is totally scalable since we're not doing OTC stocks. <laughs> yeah, I was surprised about that because maybe I, was there a specific reason in Robin Hood that prevented you or is it just for your own um, own preference for my own preference I want a short OTC stocks because <laughs> <laughs> some of my best performers this year have been OTC and these are like some really solid companies they just um, are very undervalued because they're very under the radar oh that actually makes sense when you think about it um, the fact that yeah no one knows about it it there's a greater inefficiency so better spot for yeah, good analysts to exactly buy good ones Exactly. And yeah. what I found is that, you know, yes, OTC stocks have that stigma, same with like pink sheets and stuff. But if you go through a lot of the ones based on at least starting with a core foundation of finding the good fundamental ones, like using the action score, and then going from that, looking for extra additional checks, going through, see if there's any red flags and stuff. That's what I have found uh, a lot of success. And because it's under the radar, there's low liquidity. Um, so I had to wait sometimes on occasion two weeks, two to three weeks, just being patient, setting my buy price and just dangling it out there. And for the most part, once it starts to pick up, you know, people, traders, momentum, investors, they'll all flood in. So you don't want to discount OTC all the time. Um, yeah. I just don't know how to filter properly for red flags since I just started. So um, yeah, yeah. maybe once when that happens, I'll, I'll start including them after um, yeah. I start have, I, I mean, I used to start using my exit strategy on, on these current 23. Yeah. Were there any specific other difficulties that you encountered? Like uh, you initially thought that it was going to go for one hour, but you ended up taking a three. I mean, I took, I took longer, much longer. It took me about one and a half days because I was going through so many stocks and then I was doing like a fundamental check that I'll go, with you, uh, go through for you a bit later for each one. Like aside from that, was there anything really making it tough, like your criteria or something that went from one hour to three hours? It was basically the the price and also, I mean, the price of one specific share you know, for each one. They were just too big. And then I, there weren't enough A's, uh, a, a quality <laughs> grade for me to do this. And I was like, oh man, I don't want to go to C. I don't want to go. <laughs> so I was like, let's just go to B. Uh, one thing that I also kept in mind too is I saw a, a few A's that I actually could have bought but I looked at it and I saw that would be great to hold for three to five years. And this case study is only really for one year. So that tilted my, I guess, evaluation when picking stocks for more growth and quality than for value itself. Because, you know, it mm-hmm. takes a longer time for, for you to achieve your value stocks to, to their actual price than, than growth or uh, quality. Right. 
Right. At least the assumption going in, expectation is that, you know, we don't expect big gains over one year. It's more like a long term. This is a long term goal and long term right. game. So, yeah, like you said, you know, sometimes value stocks, we have to go in with the expectation, especially if it's going on, if it's on a downhill like Sears. Or, I mean, people are still holding on to Sears for like a decade. Uh, the expectation is that it, it, you're not going to get the value over one year that's just too unrealistic right okay so let's just jump right into your portfolio then so this is the big reveal so i'm gonna get a drum roll <laughs> <laughs> and so here's the list that you gave the top two is well it's actually the top one two three four four out of the five is in the financial sector uh this year surprisingly though the financial side has been doing really good yeah, and I like the fact that you also narrowed it down. Like, I didn't include all the um, columns here for people watching, but I like how you filtered with the Piotrowski F score, mm -hmm. uh, how you chose from like seven and above. So that's immediately going to limit your stock universe, yes. Right. But at the same time, you're going to limit it towards like where there's where it's really green pastures. You're, you're, you've got a lot of fish in this area. And here's how you actually built the portfolio. <laughs> so I, I gave a good chuckle and I was like, shares to buy one, one, one. <laughs> uh, well, I did the conversion to uh, uh, make it equally distributed so I could you know, yeah. get to be $50 a share. And then when it was calculating it straight through in Excel, it, it went to straight 50. And I was like, I don't, I can't buy 1.21 of a share. Yeah, so I was like, exactly. all right, make these all whole numbers <laughs> and round down. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, that's definitely a difficulty because uh, especially with the smaller cap size, like if and if somebody was trying to do, uh, say, follow something with like, say, $5,000, it's still going to be limited by the stock prices because uh, once you get into like the A's and the B's, a lot of them are priced between like $20 and $70. Mm -hmm. And so I can see that in your list. The cheapest one is Sirius XM. And I think that's that's still a pretty good buy. I mean, Buffett bought into it, so that oh. says something. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you mean by the patterns, like breakout, bull retracement, and bull rally. So what is a breakout? I was looking at the daily time frame for all of these stocks. And a breakout is basically when the price goes into a range. If you imagine the price is kind of like trapped inside a rectangle. And it's and it's waiting to uh, break out either up or down. For this, for these stocks, when it, when I when I put them into a breakout section, I noticed that overall they've been trending up because you know they had a high growth score, right? So uh, I'm expecting for these things to break out towards the upside. I wanted to say a bull retracement was when when the stock was going up already, but the price was showing that. It's it needs to um, I don't know sort of like it, like like it needs to recharge or something so it's like gonna go into a breakout mode or it's gonna I guess what normal people see on TV is the, the, the stock is gonna correct itself so it's, in other words I think it's gonna go down so I didn't I didn't really want to buy it but I bought it for the sake of having 20 plus stocks and then <laughs> <laughs> the, the the bull rally that's basically the prime spots that you want where the stock looks like it's ready to go up. And um, those were like slam dunks. I mean, if I mean for right now, for today, specifically for today. So, if I had to choose the timing, I probably would have just picked all the ones with the bull rally. Hey, you know, it's okay because okay. our holding period is going to be like for a year, so it's not yeah. a big deal. It's like I'm okay. I'm being nitpicky over like pennies, you know. So I have no history or no expertise in technical analysis. Oh. So were you doing technical stuff beforehand? I always wanted to learn, I had a choice between fundamentals or technicals learning for, first when I was uh, doing investments and trading, right? But the reason why I picked technicals was because all assets have to trade on a price chart and technical analysis works on every single asset class. So with that in mind, I was like, hey, it seems logical that if I want to work on more than one asset, I might as well pick something that's more um, universal, more or less. Okay. But, you know, obviously, some people believe that technical analysis is like magic tricks out of a hat. So, you know, to each his own. But for me, it's still working, so I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> so one of the questions that I get a lot is if a stock drops in price or if a stock drops in rating, what do I do? When do I sell? Going back to this chart, uh, this image. I don't tend to, I don't sell that often. I mean, I reluctantly sell. 
<laughs> even if it's an F, I reluctantly sell because I just try and keep with the process and not try to meddle with it too much because I already meddle enough by trying to like look at the fundamentals and just making sure that I'm not buying any bombs. Uh, but when when a stock goes from like an A to a B to C, anything from a B to C to D, I'm more than happy to hold. But what what is your what are your thoughts right now on how you would consider like what you would do if you see something like go from an A to an F? For me, it'd be I'd probably draw a trend line and then see if it breaks towards the bottom end, but, um, or if if the trend of the price action seems to be going bearish. Um, and I'm also going to keep this in mind, um, seeing when something is an F, it's time to sell. So I guess if I look at the chart. I mean, look at look at my short list from OSB, and then see that something's turning an F. I'm definitely gonna take a look at it in the in the price action chart. I mean, the stock stock chart itself, and then see yeah. if it's going bad. And if it's going bad, then I'm definitely gonna get out of there and book my profits. While if it's an F and I see that it's continuously going up, I'm gonna let that momentum ride until until I think it dies out. Um, and I'll figure that out by drawing a trend line. So once it breaks that certain pat, uh, pattern. Um, it's time for me to let go because the way I look at it, if the market's going crazy and it's going crazy in my favor, I'm going to milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so with the portfolio maintenance, I say portfolio maintenance as in because you've already gone ahead and purchased it. Mm -hmm. well, here's some tips um, and checks that you can do which I also follow to protect against loss. This is some quick checks that I do against my own portfolio. Uh, it takes too long to like if I'm holding 20 to 25 stocks then it's going to take far too long to try and do a full complete analysis every single quarter and knowing that companies they don't turn on a dime uh, it takes a while for bad signs to really come out in the financial statements what I do in the meantime is I'll do short simple checks to make sure that uh, no red flags are coming out so that's the objective you always look for red flags always protecting the downside and you you mentioned um, downside many times uh, yeah profits are great but when we eliminate the downside and the risk of losing money then let the upside take care of itself right right I'm all looking for that asymmetric payoff to the positive right. side, obviously. <laughs> the four basic che um, checks that I would do is I'll go through the OSV ratings. Uh, if I see something where I had an A and then it suddenly dropped to like a B or C or even lower, then I'll definitely go into the ratings. I'll go into each one's um, breakdown. I'm going to show you an example very soon and then just check out the numbers. I'll do some quick initial follow up valuations and I have quality models to detect whether there's any glaring red flags and then one other thing that i do just quickly is i check for investor sentiment and what i mean by this is like i look for what type of articles or what type of analysis people are pulling out or what type of news uh, and i'm but i'm not caring about their opinions you just have to keep in the back of your mind constantly that everything you read are mostly opinions nowadays and they're not facts so it it can't sway your what you're thinking is you just have to check what the current sentiment is to check the sentiment like i just went into seeking alpha and one of my holdings new skin i just highlighted some keywords from the titles now i didn't read each one but i do have an idea pretty much basically what the articles are going to be talking about because I've just briefly gone over some points before. You can see how, you know, some are talking about it's uh, classifying this as a Peter Lynch stormwort or it's an ugly, it's ugly but it's cheap, it's MLM and this one says avoid it. This one says it's another MLM and it's using deceptive adver um, advertising practices. So obviously it's here the sentiment isn't that good but consensus that it's on the cheap side if you're interested. The next one is Gilead. Here you have uh, one way saying, okay, this is going to be a good dividend stock. Another one saying, hey, this is going to be revolutionary. I mean, that's a big speculative term right there, but who knows? Uh, there's a conundrum. There's a significant discount, discount. So when I look at this, I mean, I don't see something like, hey, um, there's all these short thesis is out there so at least that checks off that uh, there's no glare huge glaring red flag okay going in reverse checking the quality models so what i do is you've already gone through the piotrowski gilead i'm going to go to quality checks and right now we have three we'll be adding more but in the piotrowski it's a seven good 
but I'm also going to look at the historical numbers. So I'm looking at, the, you can see the historical numbers here, but if you can see like since 2014, so for the past several years, it's actually been pretty good. On the Altman Z um, score, it's showing when you go through like each independent ratio and how it works, you see that you'll notice that there's no alarming red flags, which is very good again. On the Benaish M score, you can see the makeup of it as well. And because I'm so used to doing this, I have an idea, like if I look at a number, I have a very good idea whether it's something to look into or whether it's I can consider it safe. Uh, I'm just looking to see if there are any glaring red flags that I need to check up on. And so when I do this over 20 stocks, you know, I can do it pretty quickly and I get into a rhythm and I'm able to finish it off. Going backwards again, so with the valuation, let's say in one of your stocks, let's say the first one, Universal Insurance Holdings, uh, it has a good action score but it dropped uh, to a C and I want to see why. Maybe it's because the actual value went up, uh, like the value score went up because the price appreciated. So if that's the case, um, I would go into valuation, now I'm still using Gillard as an example. I would go here, this is the dashboard, but what you have to consider is that these are all default numbers. You have to be able to adjust your numbers yourself, change the assumptions. In the DCF, another quick and dirty method that I use is with the default method and the current price of $70, I look at the reverse growth. So what the reverse growth is showing you is like, oh, what growth rate is the current stock market or the current price of the stock market pricing in to the company? And so at the current price compared to what the default fair value is saying, is saying the market is expecting a decline in growth of 9% compared to a five minus 5% 5 growth rate based on this model. Although this is negative, it's still a better number than what the market is pricing in. So the question then becomes, is the market overreacting to how the company has been performing? If, it's, if the market has been overreacting, then you know that it's a good uh, indicator that the company is cheap. Same thing with the Graham formula, you want to enter the latest corporate bond rate. Uh, you want to, if you want to play around with, you have an idea about what a future EPS estimate will be, then you just enter it into the inputs over here. Once you've gotten that, you're going to see that the average fair value for Gilead right now comes out to $65.66. Um, you, you get a sense of where that valuation is. Uh, if the value score had gone up, uh, or if the value sco score goes down, this is a quick way of quickly diving into the details. And then the first one would be is now going back to breakdown of the rating and the scores. So obviously one of the very th first things that I do when I do look at a stock is go through the action score. So I see that this is an AAC. I go through the quality score and see that it has a very high free cash flow to sales ratio. So for every $1 of sales, it's converting 50% into free cash flow. And that's just crazy. I don't know how sustainable that is. So you know, in a way that could be uh, a red flag because they're obviously gonna reinvest. That number itself uh, is gonna be on the high end. It's got a really good CROIC, so management is competent. It's just a matter of converting that into a, a positive company momentum. On the value score, Gilead is looking to, it looks to be like within a very good range. So these are just numbers. Um, follow this as a guide, uh, as a rule of thumb as to what range you want to be in. The best is like price to free cash flow. You don't want, want it to be too high. Like I look for something like around less than 10. EV to EBIT, I look for less than 11. Uh, and then price to book and peer trust score. And same with the growth score. Uh, just look at this. Gilead has been, the sales has been negative uh, over the past trailing 12 months. But over the five years, it's been positive. But then there's always this backstory with Gilead that I won't go into um, their gross profit to assets is at 0 0.43. So it's not horrible, but it's not the best. I like it closer to one because that means they're really utilizing their, their assets compared to the gross profits. And that's going to be a good start to uh, look for higher GPA.
So this was the one. There, let me just quickly run through the second example of new skin. So, and I'll do it in order this time. So I'll look at the action score. I see that it's an ADA, so it's got a bad value score. So I'll probably just immediately go to the value since it's a holding of mine. I'll look at price to free cash flow, these numbers. And from here, I don't see anything glaring. It's, it's rated a D currently because it's fallen outside of the optimal range. And compared to like how it's ranked, uh, like next to all these other stocks, it's definitely there's other ones that are probably more better in terms of value. So that's why it's getting a D. But I don't see anything um, too bad. So even if it's a, it's a D, I'm not uh, I'm not worried here. So I mean, I because of that, I could just skip over the valuation. Like I could do a uh, DCF, look at the reverse growth. So the market is pricing in 10.8%. Uh, the growth rate currently in the model is 8.83%. So now it's the inverse of what we saw with Gilead, the reverse growth. So the market is expecting higher growth, whereas the model is expecting a bit lower growth. That's why the fair value is a bit on the lower side. But now it's just a matter you start off with, okay, do, do I think this company is going to grow at a rate higher or lower than 10.75%? And then the third check was... Okay, quality models and then invest the sentiment, which is which we've already done. So quality checks. Again, I'm gonna look at it here. 14, 15, not a good year. 16 and 17, it's actually looking pretty good. So it's a good thing I didn't hold it in 14 and 15. I wouldn't I've skipped over it for sure. On the Altman Z score, I see that the numbers are well within the safe region. And same with the Benaish, lots of green there, very healthy numbers. There have been talks that they are manipulating earnings, but so far for many years, like three, four years, I haven't come across that. And that's how you would go through and quickly process a stock if it goes, if it suddenly drops and you want to do a fundamental check. Lastly, avoiding torpedoes. So here's the example that I found uh, today on Reddit. Somebody had invested because there was a buyout um, talk about Walgreens buying Rite Aid. And so uh, immediately on OSV, I looked it up. It looks like it's got an F because action, the quality is an F, value is an F, growth. Yeah, it looks pretty good. On, um, it has a B, so it's not that bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. But when I look at even value and um, quality, immediately right off the bat, this took me about three seconds to immediately dismiss it. Yet... This one person on Reddit, he put $100,000 into this one company on the speculation that Walgreens was going to buy it out at a higher price or some other buyer would come out. And like Greenblatt says, you know, if you're going to do a limited amount of work or no work, then you have to diversify. You have to limit your losses by 20 or 30. Did he and also he short Walgreens? No. Uh, <laughs> so, <what>? so it <laughs> was... <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a straight out all in 100% long uh, in well, Rite Aid. I mean, I, I don't know. You're the fundamental expert, not me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so he posted up his, uh, his proof uh, because this uh, he posted up before the actual announcement uh, earlier today. And so you can see he put in like $116,000 into one company. So he bought $30,000. Uh, 30.5k shares at $3.83 based on the logs that he posted. And after today, it's gone down to <laughs> he essentially lost about 20k in 1.5 days. And so it goes to show if you're going to do some sort of investing, if you're going to put in money into stocks, you either have to really do your research uh, to make a concentrated investment or you have to do what we're doing and diversify into 20 to 30 stocks uh, and then even out your allocation to uh, let it all work itself out. So we'll end with that. Uh, again, I will post this on, I'll create a portfolio and then so that we can track it and then I'll share it with people. 
and for the people that have been watching i hope you get something out of it i hope you've gone you see the process uh, that it takes to make this list it's not rocket science but again it's at this it's not like you just randomly throw darts at 20 stocks there's still important important criteria that you have to set think about your own criteria think about your own investment uh, capital uh, how you intend to invest, uh, what your other strategies are going to be like, uh, like how Lester is going to incorporate technicals into his buy and sells. Just just stick with the process and uh, and then trust it and then we'll see how it goes. That concludes episode two of this short two-part series. This is the spreadsheet of the initial stocks that we'll be keeping track. All transactions will be updated directly through this spreadsheet and it's going to be shared via the blog. So if you want to keep up to date with what's going on and what's being sold or bought, check back to Old School Value.